Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight podcast. I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One, and our guest today will be Bob Nunn. CEO of EverActive. EverActive produces data intelligence for the physical world based on wireless sensors that operate without batteries to deliver cloud-based analytics in situations not possible with battery-powered sensors. Together, we discussed innovations in ultra-low power circuit design and wireless communications that allow sensors to operate exclusively from energy harvested from vibrations, indoor light, and other environmental sources. And we explored how new generations of batteryless sensors can enable a trillion sensor world. I hope you found our conversation valuable, and I look forward to your thoughts and comments. Bob, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Eric, it's my pleasure. I'm uh, happy to be part of the podcast. So, Bob, you've got a actually really fascinating history. So, before we get into uh, EverActive and and your technology and your business, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you personally. Well, first off, the company name is Everactive. I'll uh, just dive in on my history. I think if you look at my career, it's been 30 plus years of uh, growing startups. And uh, there's kind of a theme to what I've done during that period of time, which I would say is applying breakthrough technologies to real world problems. And uh, Everactive is a great example of that situation. But actually, I want to give you a story early from my career that kind of describes what I'm talking about. One of my, actually my first startup, when I joined, they were proudly calling themselves the gas company, which you could imagine they maybe were distributing gas or something like that. But they actually had developed a really novel gallium arsenide semiconductor process. And of course, gallium arsenide is abbreviated gas. And the idea was that they, the market would just come to them because they had this novel technology. So uh, from that very first startup, I realized that you know what? No one cares that we're the gas company. They care of what we can do with this gallium arsenide process technology that's important to them. And what we ultimately ended up with that company was making it a uh, company that helped people serialize and deserialize data. This was back in the 80s and early 90s when we were first starting, when the internet was becoming a big deal. And this idea of being able to move data very quickly was uh, uh, just starting to grow. So we really became a data transport company had nothing to do with the material except the properties that the uh, gallium arsenide material offered to the components that we put out. But that's a good example of where a technology may uh, start as a great idea and the entrepreneurs think, oh, wow, I've got something really interesting, but it really doesn't matter until you find a real world problem and you apply the benefits of that technology to that problem. Yeah, yeah. And I want to get into a little bit uh, later in our conversation, some of the problems that you're focusing on at uh, EverActive, because you've, you've identified some very specific use cases, whereas a lot of uh, companies, in particular, a lot of startups that I look at, often have very generic domains that they're addressing. But I, I can see that you've maybe brought those learnings forward and, and really highlighted the, uh, the use cases that make sense. But let's get into that uh, a little bit later. Maybe you can first Brief us on the story behind EverActive, because this is a technology that I think actually many people, maybe maybe people listening, are, are not aware actually exists in the world today. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating. And actually, I think of EverActive as a collection of uh, breakthrough technologies. So it's actually a number of technologies coming together with a very specific purpose to remove batteries out of the electronics devices, in particular, the IoT devices that we're starting to use more and more of. And actually, um, my favorite story about the company was actually started by two professors, one at the University of Michigan and the other at the University of Virginia. But their history together goes back to graduate school at MIT, where they they both were studying low-power electronics. But as they were going through their careers as professors and they were collaborating on different things, they started hearing, and this is um, maybe six, seven years ago, they started hearing forecasts that the IoT was going to have a trillion connected things within the next five years or uh, something crazy along that, that order. And they just simply did the math. And they said, you know, battery life, uh, where it is today, if we assume that it 
increases dramatically, let's say we can get 10-year battery life on average for all devices, then if there's a trillion things connected, we would need to change batteries 275 million times a day to keep up with all the, the trillion things. And they say, you know what? The IoT is not going to take off until someone figures out how to remove the battery. And that was really the genesis for um, them wanting to start a company was let's take what we've done in low power electronics and let's go apply it to this, um, what we see as the thing that's going to hold back the Internet of Things and, uh, and really focus on what it means, what's it going to take to uh, remove the battery from the devices completely. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. And then the, I see you joined in May of 2017. Is that around the founding of the company or had they had maybe a research phase of a couple of years before bringing you in to, to help scale? Yeah. The, the uh, professors uh, spent a couple of years just taking what they had done at the university and transferring it out into a company. They actually did their first, uh, what I'll call institutional funding in 2014. So that's five years ago now. And they started to build a team at that point. But, you know, just a few people early on. And like you said, it was really technology development, proving out their ideas. They set a goal. Simply put, they wanted to create a um, semiconductor device that had all the components needed to support an IoT sensor that was one one thousandth the power of traditional semiconductor technology. So it was this uh, uh, you know, crazy goal that they uh, started the company with, one one thousandth the power. And that first few years was really around proving that they could do that, that the, the innovations that they had developed both as graduate students and then further as professors could lead to that kind of breakthrough device. And uh, so when I joined uh, two years ago, they had proven the technology. And this says a little bit about me as well. The technology was already proven. And they had actually honed in on the industrial market as the first place to apply the technology. But they hadn't really developed a product yet, and they haven't really developed a business model. They just had a concept that in the industrial market, people are already using wired or battery-powered IoT devices, so they don't have to teach people that it's important. But there are a lot of things, a lot of assets within the industrial environment that are going unmonitored because people are unwilling to put batteries. It's just not economically feasible. Or like in the case, we'll talk about steam traps later, and I'll explain what that is. But uh, with steam traps, there's just too many of them. Currently, they're manually inspected. And if you put batteries on all of them, you would have that $275 million or million battery a day problem. You'd have to go around changing batteries, you know, as much as you inspect them. So you're trading off one maintenance problem for another, and it's just, it doesn't make sense. So removing the battery opens up this whole new category of things that you can go monitor and sense in the industrial environment. But my job really was to come in and say, okay, with this technology, how do we go apply it to the market? What's the right first product? What's the roadmap? And then how do we commercialize that? What's the business model? Great. Well, maybe we can get in some of these details here. So who, who are you addressing primarily today if we look at your, your customer segments? Actually, the, uh, we chose to go after an asset as the kind of the uh, approach that we're going to take. And one of the important things to know about EverActive is we uh, quickly came to the conclusion that removing the battery requires more than just a low power chip. It's a, today at least, to remove the battery means you have to have a full vertically integrated solution, what we like to call a full stack solution. So that goes from the chip to the sensor itself, to the network on how the sensors are connected, to the uh, way data is managed and where compute is done within this, either at the sensor or in the cloud and as well as uh, the analytics that are pl applied and how the data that you collect and how you apply the analytics to that. So um, given that they uh, had determined that to solve the battery problem, you, today you have to have a full stack solution, we decided really what we should focus on is the data itself. And the, what we like to say is that uh, we're generating a new class of data streams that were previously unavailable because people were unwilling to put batteries or to wire up sensors and that the, the real key is for us to create uh, actionable insights from, that, uh, from those physical world data streams that uh, are valuable to the customers. So because of that, we actually came to the conclusion that the right business model for our company was to actually sell those insights, uh, take that data, turn them into insights, and sell them back to the customer. 
And so we picked one asset. In this case, uh, the first asset that we decided to go after was steam traps. And we uh, decided to apply that full solution, full stack solution to that problem and, and go to a number of customers across industries and say, hey, let's go address your, uh, your steam trap is- issue. So examples of industries that we're already involved in today include uh, food and beverage, uh, consumer products, uh, pulp and paper, pharmaceuticals, chemical, oil and gas, as well as uh, what we like to call district energy, but it's really the heating and cooling using steam in those applications as well. Okay, in- interesting. And does that mean that you then have an, an OPEX uh, pricing model? So is this that they, they'd pay for a, a monthly or an annual fee based on the, the insights that you're providing and that you would then deploy the sensors and own the asset? Or how does this model look like? The most important thing about working with the industrial customers is that they do want to own the assets. In most cases, if it's in their factory, they want to own it. And they definitely want to own their data. So there's no question about whose data it is. So that's one of the important things. You just have to start with the assumption that it's the customer's data. And if you're going to put an asset in their uh, factory, it's going to be theirs, whether you charge them for it or not. So we started with that premise and we said, okay, let's do annual subscriptions. So the assets that we're attaching to have been there for decades in most cases. And uh, so the idea is if we can uh, go in for the first year, uh, provide the equipment as part of the uh, service in year one, demonstrate value, then there will be a a number of years of follow-on revenue stream for us from that engagement. So that's, it is uh, what we like to call insights as a service sold on an annual subscription. And that's, you know, we have today, we've only been in the market a little less than a year, about nine months. And uh, we have, I don't know, 15 customers or so today that have signed up for that model. Great. So you, you began generating revenue around a year ago. Are you able to share any, any data either around your, your revenue, your, your growth adoption? I mean, I guess 15 customers, um, you're early enough that it's probably still a little bit hard to see what the, the long-term trend is, but any, anything that publicly you're able to, to share around your growth in, uh, since January? Actually, so I can share that our original goal was we would have uh, 10 customers by the end of the year. So that was kind of one of the things about the industrial market is the pace of adoption and the risk aversion nature of the customers has to be considered. And so you have to go into the market knowing it's going to take patience and perseverance to really um, demonstrate your value, first get in the door and then demonstrate your value before they really start to scale. And those the patience is not something you normally associate with startups and particularly with startup investors. But it really is a a requirement in uh, going after the industrial market. Big payoff if you have the patience and perseverance to make it through and build the relationships with the customer, but it it does take time. So our model was based on that. It's like, let's go find a few great customers, go build relationships with those, and then uh, we can sell them more of the steam trap monitoring systems either within the same factory or in most cases, these Fortune 100 companies have multiple factories that do similar type things. So we can uh, move from one factory to another. And then more importantly is our plan is to continue to innovate uh, and generate new products going after new assets. And then we start adding uh, new assets within the same factory. So we actually expand across multiple vectors with these great customers. So the original plan with 10 customers, we're about 15 now, hopefully be, you know, we'll double our initial projection for the year. Most of the deployments are small. We have just within the last 30 days deployed at a, can't say the customer's name, but I can say that it's a pet food factory. And uh, we are, it's the first time that we've deployed uh, steam trap monitors across the entire factory. And that's really our goal is pervasive sensing. You don't just do a few of the high volume, high value assets you do all the assets. And we really have tried to create a pricing model that is compelling to say, yeah, it makes sense. If I'm going to do this for one, I'm going to do it for all. And uh, so that was, we were really proud of that one, that it was our first full factory deployment. Otherwise, what we're finding is most people are deploying a few hundred sensors, trying them out for a while, and then again, building this relationship and trust, making sure we don't break anything or that uh, we don't uh, 
you know, mistakes are very expensive in these uh, manufacturing plants. So make sure that there's nothing that goes wrong before they start to expand out and deploy more. Okay. But that last, um, with the, you said it was a pet food factory. That's, uh, that's interesting because I suppose with steam traps, it sounds like that's a, a use case where current sensors are not a very viable solution. And so the, the solution are people. And so you have, you have the, you're, let's say, providing a, a fairly radical uh, solution for that particular use case. If you're addressing a whole factory, I suppose now you're competing kind of head on head with more traditional, either wired or, or battery powered sensors. I know you're still quite early in the process here, but can you point to any ROI if you're comparing a battery list to a, a battery or a wired, a wired sensor? And then what would be the components there? Because I suppose the, the cost of the battery itself is probably not critical. It's, it's more the labor associated with changing the battery. Maybe that would be the, the critical factor here. And actually, it's both. So the biggest competition for us is the old way of doing things, the way it's always been done, which is mostly manual. I'd say you know, 98, 99% of all steam traps are monitored manually. So on some cadence and you know, survey cadence of like once a year, once every two years. There are automated battery powered steam trap monitors available in the market today, and they have been for some time. So it's not a new concept that it would be great if we could monitor these um, in an automated fashion. The, uh, the issue comes in that there are so many of them, you have this battery problem that you're not willing to um, trade off putting um, so many batteries that you still have to send out a maintenance guide to change batteries on a regular cadence the same way you had to do to just go inspect them. So that's probably the biggest thing we run into is that there's no way I'm going to put, you know, a refinery can have tens of thousands. So I'm not going to put 20,000 batteries out in my refinery and then have to send guys out going to change batteries either proactively. You know, it's like the uh, smoke detectors in our house. There's only a small handful of them, but when they start beeping, it drives us crazy and we have to go find a ladder and go change them. Or we can be very proactive and start changing our batteries every six months or a year. So that's what the factory managers look at when they look at battery powered sensors is that there's a maintenance schedule that goes along with that. But to give you some economics on uh, current solutions out there. So again, we are selling as a service and the hardware is included. So the upfront cost to the customer is really the cost to install the, uh, the sensors uh, themselves, which of course we are working diligently to make as low as possible, make it as easy as possible to uh, deploy the solution. With some of the battery powered solutions that are out there, there are hundreds, if not a thousand dollars in um, capital costs up front to buy the sensor. And then the batteries, because in many cases they're going into very difficult environments, in some case hazardous uh, locations where batteries that, as an explosive element have to be contained and you know, there's very elaborate enclosures that go with them. The batteries in, uh, in some cases are two, $300 a piece. And with battery lives in the order of, you know, of a couple of years, two to three years. So that the economics of that solution has been looked at and discarded and said, you know, that's just, that doesn't solve my problem. I'll just keep manually inspecting them. But uh, uh, when we come in with this new business model, with a, uh, a compelling annual subscription fee saying, hey, we'll monitor all your steam traps and you will be able to, you know, we can make a very compelling ROI case. I'd actually, I can give you uh, an example of that from one of our customers. Actually, before I do that, um, do you think it would be useful for the listeners to actually talk about what steam traps are? Or do you think uh, we're all up to speed on uh, steam traps? Yeah, no, I think that would be useful. So steam traps and then flare systems are another a use case that you have prioritized on your website. So maybe you can explain a little bit about what those two systems are and then, and then also why they are the right asset class for, for a first entry point. Yeah, that's a, a great question. We get it often from investors and others of, uh, you know, uh, why do steam traps? What was the reason that you picked that? I do think it's a great example of uh, how removing the battery unlocks customer value. So, you know, just as we talked about, the, you're not trading off one maintenance problem for another. You don't have this ongoing battery cost. You really are able to address a known operating efficiency. And then, uh, the, you know, something that's been standard operating procedure for decades. So it's kind of a radical new approach to a really old long-term problem. So 
So what it is, actually, uh, steam is a major part of our industrial world. It's actually been used for over 100 years and you know, really powered the industrial revolution. Um, but even today, um, there's a, the Department of Energy reports that uh, 30% of the total energy used in industrial applications is used in generating steam. So it's still a big part of what we, we use in today's uh, industrial world. You know, we use a centralized boiler system and then distribute the steam in pipes. And one of the problems that was discovered uh, decades ago is that as the steam is used or uh, cools, it con- that you get condensate in the lines, and that can make the steam system less efficient. It can damage equipment, and even in worst-case scenarios, it can cause explosion through something called water hammers. So many, many years ago, they de- developed a valve to remove the condensation out of the steam distribution system. So instead of calling it a steam or a condensate relief valve, they called it a steam trap, but that's simply what it does. The problem with steam traps is that they are in a toxic environment and they're a mechanical device of some sort. There are different types of steam traps, but generally there is uh, lots of data to show that steam traps fail on a regular cadence about once every five years or so, or about 20%, I think another DOE uh, figure is 20% of all steam traps fail each year. They can either fail in a state where they're open and uh, called blow through where the the steam trap is effectively doing its job. It's removing the condensate from the steam lines. Uh, It's like having your air conditioner on with the windows open. You're just wasting energy through this this open window. Or they can fail closed in a, a case where they're not doing their job and you have all those risks that I just associated with before they invented the steam trap. So we actually base our economic case on the, just the open. And the reason for that is as we talk to people about, uh, it becomes very controversial on how do you value a piece of down equipment or a down line or even the uh, injury associated with an explosion. So because there wasn't general agreement, we said, all right, let's just go look at this blow through, this open case of the steam trap. And let's, it's actually beautiful because it's easy to value the energy loss in that case. And it's uh, simply a measure of looking at the pressure of the steam, the cost to uh, generate the steam, the size of the orifice of the steam trap where the the steam's uh, blowing through, and then how often you inspect your steam trap. So with those variables, you can go in and you can actually calculate if I was to inspect the steam traps every minute and I was to replace them when they failed, I would be able to save X number of dollars. So business case that we like to use is from a chemical refinery, one of our customers, and uh, they have 3,800 steam traps. And uh, they, using their own calculation, using their own numbers for the cost of steam and the pressure and so forth, they calculated that they would save about $5 million a year if they addressed steam trap failures, blow through failures immediately. We created a business model that actually provides them a payback in less than six months. So they go in, can pay for the uh, first annual subscription and all the installation costs within six months from those, from those savings and a 3x ROI over a five year period. So it's really a compelling economic case. And that's why we've gotten so much attention from uh, such great customers. Hmm. Okay. Very interesting. And sounds like the status quo was checking them once or twice per year. What did you arrive at as a, a reasonable cadence? Are you, are you able with your technology? Actually, I'm curious, maybe as a separate point, because your, your technology is battery and, and then deriving energy from the environment, how frequently you are able in an optimal situation to collect and, and transmit data. But maybe that, that, uh, that's a, a separate question. But what did you determine as the right cadence here? That's a great question. I, actually, we had a development partner on Steam Trap Monitoring. It was a consumer products good company, one of the you know, top Fortune 100 companies. And uh, uh, their original thought was, you know, we check these once a year right now. If you just checked it once a month, that would be great. And we said, nah, we said checking it once a month. That's, you know, anybody can do that. Why don't we check it, you know, uh, once a week? And then pretty soon we said, you know what? We can do this every hour. You know, we can do it every day. We can do it every hour. We got it down and said, why don't we just do this every uh, 10 seconds? And the uh, beauty is as you generate more data, you start to see new insights. And one of the things that is uh, important to us 
is to go from individual assets to entire environment. So in this case, it would be going from the Steam trap to the Steam system, uh, to that whole distribution system. And already with the data we've collected, we've started th seeing things like uh, equipment interaction with the boiler, causing it to uh, basically over boil for a short period of time, but on a regular cadence where you're, you're wearing out the boiler. So that was at one of our customers where we saw the spike in steam temperature. We didn't know what it was. We went to them and said, hey, what do you think this is? And they said, oh, I don't know, but that's not, that shouldn't be happening. So they, they figured out it was a, a reaction with another piece of equipment. So that's something you would never find if you were doing it once a, a month or even once a day, because unless you checked it at the right time. So the beauty is, with our battery list technology, and we'll talk, I know, more about technology, but uh, our devices are always on, always active, and thus the name Ever Active. Uh, we have the ability to drive down to very fine grain uh, measurement levels. And actually, our devices aren't simply just collecting energy and then take measurements when they're ready. We actually have uh, energy storage in our sensors, and we proactively pull the sensors and ask them to report back. So they're always on, always available, always ready to do whatever the, the job that we set them to do. Yeah, let's take a few minutes now and um, go a bit deeper into your, your tech stack, maybe starting with the power system itself. So my intuition initially was that you're, you would be able to collect data maybe once a week, maybe once a day, but you'd basically have to be generating energy for some significant period of time in order to collect a, a data and, and transmit it. Sounds like that's not the case. What is the underlying technology that allows you to you know, have a, a fairly high uh, frequency of data transfer? Actually, what you describe is exactly the way uh, many people are trying to solve the battery, battery list problem. They're uh, simply turning the device off, uh, letting it uh, collect enough energy so that it can do its function, and then wake up and transmit, you know, basically just beacon out the answer, uh, hoping someone's listening, and then going back to sleep until they collect enough energy to do it again. That's not at all what we do. So the key breakthroughs for our technology really are at the chip level, and it's going back to our two professors. And uh, it's really across a number of innovations, most important of which are the uh, receiver. We've actually separated the receiver from the transmitter in our uh, radio. And the receiver, uh, we've lowered the power to such an extent that uh, it is always on. So if you're familiar with uh, watts associated with your light bulb and you know, lots of watts associated with your computer. We actually are working off of nanowatts, a few hundred nanowatts for our receiver radio. So it's an amazing innovation. It's really, it was a huge breakthrough. This is some of the research that the company got started with. The other thing that the, the company has done, and this was again in association with this thousand times lower power goal, we have actually readdressed the way that uh, digital electronics is done. And you'll find other chip companies starting to use this technology as well. It's called sub-threshold digital processing. And the, the basic concept is transistors, as we all know, are, are like a light switch. They're either on or they're off. You know, when they're on, they're uh, in the one state, and they're off and they're in the zero state. We, we can do useful things with that binary action. But the, the reality of the transistor is that when it's off, it's actually leaking current. So it's not completely off. It's like a, a faucet you turn off that's still dripping water. And the interesting thing is, as you go, you turn transistors on and off uh, with voltage. And as you drop the voltage further in the off state, you get a different leakage current. It actually goes down the further, uh, lower the voltage goes. So we're actually doing useful work when the transistor is traditionally considered off. And you know, it's kind of like washing the dishes with, a little, with that little drip of water from, the fa from a leaky faucet. And that, so that sub-threshold digital design technology we use both for our uh, processing elements as well as for another key element, which is how we uh, interface to the energy harvesting um, unit, whatever that is and then how we store that energy and have it available when the device is called upon to do something useful. And so that power management unit, you'll find those in you know, our phones and any other IoT device, but we've uh, specifically designed ours using the sub-threshold design methodology to be focused on using harvested energy and effectively harvesting from multiple sources 
being able to uh, put that in a storage element and then have it available when needed. So those are kind of three of the key innovations. Of course, putting it all together on one ship is a big thing. As you uh, know from uh, any uh, chip company who talked to, the integration, what they call the system on a chip, is a big part of the design. So you can have low-power components, but you won't end up with a low-power chip unless you put a lot of thought into uh, how to do that. So it's really that the uh, low-power receiver, the sub-threshold uh, voltage, the energy harvesting PMU, and the, uh, the what we call the Uncore, a term we stole from Intel, on how everything gets put together that really makes up. And we did hit that goal of a 1,000 times lower power than uh, traditional chips that are up in, in the world today. Okay. And then the, the energy that you're harvesting, you, you mentioned that it can come from different sources. Is this a third party or partner technology that you're using to harvest the energy or, or was this also designed internally? Uh, maybe if I could divide this into two questions, that would be you know, one. So what are you harvesting and, and uh, whether this is maybe commercially available technology or something you built up? And then the second question uh, as a follow on here would be, how much energy is needed? Are there some environments that are more energy rich where this functions well? And are there other environments that maybe don't have the energy sources, so the signals uh, and so forth, that, that back, you know, background radiation that you would be um, harvesting here and, and, and are then more difficult to operate it for that reason? There are lots of uh, energy sources available, but there's really four main ones that uh, we can draw from. And they have one characteristic in common with the exception of sunlight, which is very different. But once you come indoors, um, we look at uh, uh, indoor light, thermal differentials. So uh, like in our case of the steam trap monitor, the, the difference between the pipe that's carrying the steam and the air around it. You can also look at vibration as an energy source and then RF signals as an energy source. So there's kind of the four biggies today. People are working on some really new, interesting things as well. The one characteristic they all have in common is this very small amount of energy. And you're talking about uh, tens of microwatts per square millimeter of whatever material you're using to harvest energy, whether that's a PV cell or thermal electric generator for the temperature differential. And so that you're dealing with uh, microwatts of power that you're getting from your source. And traditional electronics, even traditional low power, and we talk about DLE as a low power uh, radio technology, even in, when it's turned off, it's consuming more than that in, um, in power. So you know, when, once you turn it on, it's milliwatts of power. So you know, a thousand times more power. So the small amounts of energy that you get from indoor sources, that's been around for a long time. So there's nothing a novel that we've done there except look for and partner with the best companies. And there is a lot of neat innovation going on in the harvesting space, and we are, are working with them, but still we're dealing with extremely small amounts of energy. Unlike once you go outdoors and you get the energy from the sun, for us, that's a massive amount of energy. It's a, you know, it's a, outdoor light is a much better source of energy than anything that you can get uh, indoors. So, and actually it, it brings up a good point that uh, we have developed the electronics for managing those energy harvesters. We also manage all the sensors. So we, we do not do our own harvesters or our own sensors. That's not part of the innovation of the company. But we do bring that all together, and we do work closely with those vendors to make sure that they are, you know, the interfaces are low power, and that, you know, they are the same way we're obsessed and our passion is about removing battery from the sensor that they work with us to uh, take out some big power consumers out of their product as well. So we have basically ever active certified set of energy harvesters and uh, certified sensors that we work with. And we continue to look for new vendors and new breakthroughs in those, those fields. Yeah, well, I'm sure the energy harvesting uh, companies are, are happy to see you enter the market because <laughs> other, otherwise they have, uh, they have a technology that doesn't uh, that, you know, by itself provide the solution, right? They exactly. Have, they, have a, they have a component. But, they have uh, a lot of devices that are off 99% of the time. So that's the... Uh, yeah, the key here is that because of that low power receiver, our device is always listening, always active. And so even with the small amount of energy that we get from indoor sources, and actually I should mention, you know, the bigger the temperature differential, the easier it is to, uh, to harvest energy. So the steam pipe is a ton of energy for us. So we actually, for our second generation 
platform. You mentioned uh, Flare Systems, and that's part of it's a derivative product off of the same platform that uh, we're doing the Steam product. But we've actually j- developed a new generation, a new chip, uh, new capabilities that we'll be releasing the first part of uh, next year. And in that platform, you can actually run off the heat of your thumb. So you can put your your thumb on a uh, thumb electric generator and generate enough temperature differential for us to pop up the device. So that's a part of what we're doing. I'm curious about the uh, the building or the infrastructure use case because I've talked to a number of companies that are somehow interested in embedding sensors in infrastructure, whether that's a building, a bridge, a road, to determine the state of that infrastructure and when it might need to be repaired or whether it's damaged. And there, I suppose, you have maybe in a bridge, you do have some significant amount of vibration in a building, probably less so. You probably have some energy constraints there. And also, you we haven't really talked about the transceiver yet and the receiver and, and how far you're able to broadcast. But I, I assume that in some situations, uh, that can also be a constraint on the, uh, the, the use cases. I'll get to the uh, construction and infrastructure um, comment in a second or a question. The uh, transmitter, I am challenging the team to figure out, but they insist that there are physics laws that we cannot break to reduce the power of the transmitter further. We're working on it. But uh, yeah, the uh, power of the transmitter is directly proportional to the distance and the the quality of the signal and the amount of data being uh, transferred. So that's definitely the largest out of our sensor itself. The largest power consumer is the transmitter. And so a lot of what we've done, we've been using our sub-threshold digital um, uh, design techniques to put uh, processing elements inside the the sensor itself so that you don't have to communicate all the raw data out on the receiver. So it's really understanding uh, what can you process locally and uh, the trade-off of doing computation of the, you know, again, off of harvested energy, but doing it locally versus sending out all that raw data on a very expensive uh, transmitter. So that's another big part of what we do is being able to adaptively figure out where is the right place to do compute. So like in the first product on our second generation platform, we'll be focused on motors and uh, uh, monitoring the health of motors. And again, there's millions and millions of motors out there of all varieties. You take a ton of data, uh, vibration data, electromagnetic data, temperature, humidity, all this data is being taken uh, at the motor itself but we can actually turn that time series data into frequency domain data and then look for the uh, key parameters and then just communicate those out. And uh, we can actually, through analytics in the cloud, we can get a good picture of what's going on with that motor and be able to detect when something changes, when uh, something's happened that's causing the motor to not run as efficiently as it was. So in that case, we can then send a signal to the sensor and say, okay, send us or start collecting um, raw data and then transmit that out through the receiver. And of course, we can only do a certain amount of raw data because of the uh, cost of transmitting that to the receiver, but we have the ability to take uh, snapshots in time and say, okay, here's what's going on. And you can then do more advanced analytics in the cloud based off of that raw data. So you kind of adaptively learn when you need, when you can use the KPIs and when you need the raw data itself. How many meters would you typically be constrained to right now? Yes, so that is a key parameter for us. So uh, a couple of key innovation vectors for us are really putting more and more processing on the node, eventually doing inference and machine learning type things at the node level. The other one is to increase the range of the radio. And the key thing, you hear people talk about uh, radio ranges, and uh, there's, there's actually different like all things, you can talk about what happens in free space where there's no obstacles and uh, life is good, or you can talk about the application itself. So in our case, uh, we're talking about steam jungles of pipes and you know brick walls and all sorts of uh, obstacles. And so when we talk about range, we're actually talking about within that industrial environment. And so for our steam trap monitoring product for uh, generation one, we get about 30 meters or 100 feet of range um, between the sensor and the gateway that it communicates to. But for Gen 2, for the, this motor uh, health monitoring product I mentioned, we have increased that tenfold. So, and again, it's innovation vector we're focused on to say, hey, we need more range. And for Gen 3, we're, we're already working since Gen 2 is about to come, up, come out, the team's already working on Gen 3, and the idea is to take it up to a kilometer. 
So to really to take this concept of a, a self-powered or environmentally powered component and be able to transmit uh, and receive a kilometer away. Okay. Yeah. I- incredible. Well, that will certainly open up some new use cases. But let's let's return then to the building. I'm sure this is something you've discussed internally before. It's a, it leads to a great topic, which is we are a startup. We're just passed through 50. We'll probably be around 60 people by the end of the year. And we cannot do it all. So the applicability of a batteryless data collection system is huge. It goes everywhere. And so we get a lot of major companies that are approaching us saying, hey, could you put this in the construction place space? Or could you go after this asset? Or could you solve this you know, metro problem? Or, or many, many different things. And the answer almost invariably is yes, we can. The technology will support that. And in particular, as we continue, as I mentioned, with the, the increases in range and uh, compute power, we can do more and more of those. So construction and infrastructure is one that we considered ourselves, but uh, more recently we've started working in partnership with one of the major construction companies and really looking at some very innovative job site sensors that would make a a huge difference. We don't yet have a partner in actually embedding the sensors into construction. You You were talking about into buildings and things like that. It's definitely something that could be done. Again, you'd have to work through all the radio and harvesting issues, but it's quite possible. And I would say uh, today we probably have, we again, we can only support so many partnerships, but there's probably 15 to 20 co- companies that have approached us and said, wow, we really like what you're doing. Could you apply this technology to our problem? Yeah. <laughs> well, scope creep is a, is a problem for startups. So it sounds like you guys have done a, a good job of staying focused so far. No doubt you'll have a, the, the continued challenge of deciding where to focus going forward. Let's take some time now then to deep dive into one of these these case studies. If you can, you know, whether it's the, the pet food manufacturer that you mentioned earlier or, or another uh, case that's already been deployed and, and walk us through from initial discussions through deployment, through operations and just give us a, a clear picture on what this looks like. And then in particular, maybe what are some of the, the concerns that companies have that you discuss? And, and maybe what are some of the challenges that you've uh, faced and, and uh, addressed uh, as you're figuring out the right deployment? Our strategy has been to prove that it works and to show people what's possible. And uh, the steam trap monitoring product is a great example where we can uh, you know, find steam experts, go talk to them, explain what we're doing, and get uh, in the door and have a meeting with customers. And the, I should mention that the, uh, the first you know, 15 customers have all been direct sales from our team. We actually just hired our VP of uh, sales about a month ago. So it's really been the business development and myself and the founders that are out there trying to, to get the attention of customers. But now that we have gotten their attention, we're getting the attention of uh, some of the asset manufacturers. So like steam trap manufacturers are coming to us and saying, hey, what you're doing is interesting. Is there something we could do together? You know, they may have a, a software tool that they would like to integrate with our data acquisition uh, capability. And that's also led to partners in the sales channel. So that's been a big part of our growth over this the last six months is adding uh, sales partners. So whether that be sales representatives or value-added system integrators, even service organizations. So I mentioned the, uh, the installation. One of the things we'd like to offer to the customer is the ability to use an outsourced service organization that they already know and is qualified in their factory to do that uh, installation for them. So that's been a uh, uh, big focus. That's part of our growth now, bringing in, building a real sales team, bringing in a sales channel, and that will help accelerate finding customers. And these are complex, large organizations. So the, part of it is finding the right people and then um, navigating through the complexity of making the sale. So you have to kind of walk through what it's like. So in the, the initial days, we would be going to conferences or we would be using uh, email campaigns to find somebody at one of our target customers in one of our target industries to start the conversation. It's a compelling conversation because people know the steam trap problem is not new. They know that it's uh, been an accepted inefficiency for years and years. And then we can say, hey, you could address that and you could save a lot of money uh, with our solution. So we get, we get in the door and we can have a meeting may or may not be with the right people. Most times not. And uh, it's something where you go, okay, who in the organization are the right people for us 
to talk to. And invariably, for a solution of this type, you really need to talk to the, the people in the facility. So a lot of times that's the maintenance director or even the facility manager. And a lot of times the business unit executives themselves will get involved because they are where the, the cost savings, the cost of steam in terms of going into making their product and the benefit of uh, saving that really uh, hits their uh, P&L. So it is a, there is complexity just in the sales process just because they're a large, complex organization. So we navigate through that. We get to uh, the right people and they say, okay, great, let's try it out. A lot of times try it out is, you know, I want to do a pilot. And I think there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of talk in the startup world about uh, pilots being the death of startups. There's actually some clever terminology people have created to say, you know, death pipe pilot. We try to avoid that. And we actually say, let's go do a full deployment, even if it's a limited size. Let's go do a full deployment. Let's sign up for a year and uh, let's start collecting data. And that's probably our biggest sales tool is that once we start collecting the data and we start showing the savings, so our, our user interface actually will show um, how many steam traps are in blow through, how much money you're wasting every day by not fixing them, how much money you save by fixing them. You know, it's, it's, it really is a compelling business case to say, yeah, you, know, you are getting value from the solution. So that process uh, is normally on the, I, we've, uh, probably as short as three months, but up to six or nine months of going through, getting to know the solution, getting to feel comfortable with it before we start talking about, all right, let's add more. Let's go do the entire plant, like we talked about with the, the pet food factory. And, or in some cases now, we, were, we just announced a, a funding round uh, recently, uh, and uh, we were fortunate to have one of our customers uh, in that uh, round. So uh, Colgate Palmolive was uh, quoted for us. And so I, this is one of the few customers I can talk about at this point. But uh, they were already in talks from the first plant being able to start to talk about, let's uh, look at other plants throughout their manufacturing infrastructure and plants that do similar to continuous manufacturing operations. So that's probably the biggest part. And that's what we're focused on today is, okay, we've got a great set of customers across a broad uh, scope of industries, and we need to go build that relationship, go get further deployments, and then start telling them about you know, Flare System, uh, we skipped over that, but we should come back and talk about the, uh, what that product is about. But uh, all the people that have steam traps also have motors. And so in every case, and it's a, a really hot topic today in terms of there are a number of companies that are doing battery-powered motor or machine health monitoring solutions. And we're the only one coming out and saying, hey, we can do this maintenance-free. You know, we could put a uh, sensor in place that will last for decades without ever um, being have, having to send a maintenance guy to to take care of it. Well, that's going to be a huge, huge use case. Quick uh, follow up question, just uh, before we we uh, go on um, the deployment. Are we talking? Are we talking a, a one day something that uh, your your team is able to handle internally, or is this a, a larger effort that requires a system integrator to get involved? No, it's actually the initial deployments was handled by our team. And we do have, we have a master pipe fitter, steam trap guy on our staff, and he's been able to lead uh, deployments. More recently, we've been training customers to do that. And uh, so, and uh, we, as I mentioned, we're starting to build up the service organizations and we're training them to do that as well. So that's ultimately, we're not going to scale to be a service organization to install the the solution for the customer, we really need to enable others. And it really is, the goal is to make the uh, sensor itself, you're able to install it without tools within less than five minutes. I think the record for one of our customers is they installed it in about uh, 90 seconds. Uh, and then there's, you know, we're automated the, um, the ability to pair and provision the sensor, kind of like what you do in your home uh, network when you add a security device or an IoT device there, where it's really easy to go through a, a set of online steps and then boom, the sensor's up and running. So we really have focused on trying to make that as quick and easy uh, process as possible. Yeah, I mean, machine condition monitoring, this is uh, obviously a, a huge, uh, huge use case with um, really a very diverse range of, uh, uh, of applications. But then um, the other, the, uh, fl- uh, what is this, uh, Flare? Uh, system monitoring. System monitor. Yeah, that, that's a, again a more a more specific one. How did you arrive at that? As your maybe your second of the more focused use cases that you're prioritizing. 
I mentioned that there's a generation of technology difference between the uh, the steam and the machine uh, product for us. But within the first generation, uh, we have had a number of customers request specific products. So it's like, would, could we put the same product on our heat exchanger? Could we put it on this heating coil or different thing? The one that appealed to us, and again, you mentioned it, the focus is key. So you can only do so many things in a, a startup in parallel. And the one that caught our attention was really in the oil and gas space, this concept of a, in a refinery, you have flare stacks, and when they go off, that's a failure. Something went wrong. And uh, you would really uh, like to avoid that completely. And the uh, way you do that, either to avoid it or to be able to rectify it, is you need to know where that overpressure within your complicated refinery, where that overpressure event came from. And uh, it was described to us by one of our uh, customers that we were talking to about steam traps. He said, you know, the problem is I, if I have a flare event, I send everyone out to go find it. what happened, what course is coming from. I really need an automated way to help direct that investigation. And so we actually came up with the uh, concept of really putting out, a again, a large array of sensors on uh, pressure relief valves that can tell you specifically where the pressure buildups are coming from. And so it's a, a pretty simple extension of what we've been doing with steam traps. Again, looking at a valve and uh, measuring temperature differentials, but applied to a whole new problem. And in this case, it's a system-wide event. You know, it doesn't do any good just to have it on one pressure relief valve. You really need to look at all the headers within the steam system and be able to detect. And in some cases, you know, be able to detect when the steam, or I'm sorry, when the uh, pressure is building so that you can uh, take action either in your uh, recovery system or be able to send people out and go uh, take action before you have a flare event. And so that, that product's really focused specifically at the large oil and gas and uh, chemical refinery space where they have flare stacks. And uh, part of the idea behind that product is that it is a higher value solution than just talking about uh, the asset that is the steam trap. And uh, the fun part is that as you go do these flare system solutions, there are thousands of steam traps sitting around. It's like, okay, well, since we're here, why don't we hook these up? And then uh, you can save money there too. I see that you've raised um, a Series uh, C recently. So congratulations. I, and uh, I suppose this is going to be the round that really funds launch of the business and, and uh, the, the scale. Can you provide a little bit of, um, of detail on that? Um, I don't know if you're able to share how much you raised, but where you uh, intend to invest this uh, in, in growth. I think you've already mentioned building out a service team. I, I see that uh, ABB was one of the, the strategic investors there. So maybe there's also uh, investment in, in partners uh, with companies such as this. Where is your priority going to be over the next two years? Is it more around uh, building a new product, uh, scaling up sales team, entering new ge- uh, geographic regions? Uh, where, where do you see this, uh, this fund being? I, I am happy to share with you. We raised $30 million in this uh, last round. The lead investor was actually Future Fund, which is, is the uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund of Australia. So it's a very large venture investor. And then uh, our other key supporter, the, the fund that has been uh, supporting the company since the beginning, is uh, New Enterprise Associates, which is one of the oldest, uh, most prestigious and um, largest venture funds here in the Silicon Valley. So we have two incredibly great, uh, strong investors behind the company. We uh, also uh, added some great smaller but uh, focused investors around the oil and gas space or the the energy space. And then, as you mentioned, ABB as a strategic investor. And so without giving away too much, but we were talking about partnerships and motors and obviously uh, ABB would fall into the category of someone that would be great to partner with around uh, uh, motor monitoring technology. What do we do with the money? As you said, we are at the point of the business starts to expand. So part of it was getting the money in place so that we could go out and hire that VP of sales and he could go to start to uh, to build out the sales channel and really um, build our presence. On the development side, the fun part, one of the, the great things about this company is that we actually have two threads going on at the same time. One is we are building a business in the industrial space. We have plans for new products. The uh, first, the motor health monitor is the first of what I anticipate to be 
multiple products based on that Gen 2 platform, uh, hopefully two or three more in uh, 2020 coming out based on that platform. So really having the ability to do some very interesting things, gas sensing, uh, some acoustic solutions, uh, you know, different really uh, compelling new sensors uh, based off of that. And then in parallel, we are working on the next generation of technology. We're really driving that technology vector to the next level. And, uh, you know, it, it will apply to industrial, but it really also will empower us to be able to expand beyond industrial into other uh, areas as well. And uh, some of the really interesting things there would be around camera technology or locationing, things like that, that uh, traditionally wouldn't think of to be able to do in a batteryless uh, manner. So that's from the development side, it's both product development, getting new products out, as well as this uh, ever never ending drive on the technology side to uh, not only, as we mentioned, increase the range and the compute capability, but decrease the form factor, reduce the cost. Our goal for this company is eventually create a, a sensor that's the size of a stamp that has all the components you would need to harvest energy, do compute, have all the radios and the sensors built into that little stamp form factor that you could put everywhere. Is there a another startup, let's say an early stage startup that's that's on your radar? I, I assume that you're in the position in your career where you're probably also doing some personal investments here and there, but it doesn't have to be a company you've invested in. Just is there is there a company that uh, you think is doing something particularly interesting today? I'll call them out. I don't know if they appreciate it or not, but Niansa is a company that I've admired for quite some time. And they just recently created a security product that I think is just incredible. Um, so they start out as kind of a network management platform, operations management, application efficiency or improvement, but it included the entire network and it went out and, you know, looked at the uh, Wi-Fi and all the devices associated, all the point devices associated with that network, not just looking at the core uh, network itself. So with that as a basis, they've actually created an IoT security platform that uh, I haven't talked to them in a while, but I imagine that's got to be just a uh, rocket ship for them that's uh, uh, where they can go using, similar to uh, Google's web crawler, (laughs) they have a a crawler that goes out and figures out what's on your network, what are all the different uh, IoT devices out there. And then because of the massive amount of data they've taken, they can start saying, okay, well, here are your security vulnerabilities based on what's happened with other people or, or what we've seen with those devices. So they're one that I would call out that I think is really uh, interesting and compelling. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.